in this world, when it was destitute of brightness and light, and enveloped all around in total darkness, there came into being, as the primal cause of creation, a mighty egg, the one inexhaustible seed of all created beings. It is called Mahadevya, and was formed at the beginning of the Yuga, in which we are told was the true light Brahma, the eternal one, the wonderful and inconceivable being present alike in all places, the invisible and subtle cause, whose nature partaketh of entity and non-entity. From this egg came out the Lord Pitamaha Brahma, the one only Prajapati, with Sureguru and Stanu. Then appeared the twenty-one Prajapatis, viz. Manu, Vasishta, and Parameshti, ten Prachitas, Daksha, and the seven sons of Daksha. Then appeared the man of inconceivable nature, whom all the Rishis know, and so the Visve Devas, the Adityas, the Vasus, and the twin Aswins, the Yakshas, the Kayas, or the Pichas, the Guya, Kaya, Kaya, Kakako. After these were produced, the wise and most holy Brahmarshis, and the numerous Rajarshis, distinguished by every noble quality. So, the water, the heavens, the earth, the air, the sky, the points of the heavens, the years, the seasons, the months, the fortnights, called Pakshas, with day and night in due succession. And thus were produced all things which are known to mankind. And what is seen in the universe, whether animate or inanimate, of created things, will at the end of the world, and after the expiration of the Yuga, be again confounded. And at the commencement of other Yugas, all things will be renovated, and, like the various fruits of the earth, succeed each other in the due order of their seasons. Thus continueth perpetually to revolve in the world, without beginning and without end, this wheel which causeth the destruction of all things. The generation of Devas, in brief, was thirty-three thousand, thirty-three hundred and thirty-three. The sons of Div were Brihadbanu, Chakshus, Atma Vibhavasu, Savita, Richika, Akka, Banu, Asavaha, and Ravi. Of these Vivaswans of old, Mahya was the youngest whose son was Devavrata. The latter had for his son Suvrata, who, we learn, had three sons, Dasajyoti, Satajyoti, and Sahasrajyoti, each of them producing numerous offspring. The illustrious Dasajyoti had ten thousand, Satajyoti ten times that number, and Sahasrajyoti ten times the number of Seta Jyoti's offspring. From these are descended the family of the Kurus, of the Yadus, and of Bharata, the family of Yayati, and of Aikshwaku, also of all the Rajashis. Numerous also were the generations produced, and very abundant were the creatures and their places of abode. The mystery which is threefold the Vedas, Yoga, and Vijnana Dharma, Artha, and Kama, also various books upon the subject of Dharma, Artha, and Kama, also rules for the conduct of mankind, also histories and discourses with various srutis, all of which, having been seen by the Rishi Vyasa, are herein. Due order mentioned as a specimen of the book. The Rishi Vyasa published this mass of knowledge in both a detailed and an abridged form. It is the wish of the learned in the world to possess the details and the abridgment. Some read the Bharata beginning with the initial mantra, invocation, others with the story of Astika, others with Uparishara, while some Brahmanas study the whole. Men of learning display their various knowledge of the institutes in commenting on the composition. Some are skillful in explaining it, while others in remembering its contents. The son of Satyavati having, by penance and meditation, analyzed the eternal Veda, afterwards composed this holy history, when that learned Brahmashi of strict vows, the noble Dwepayana Vyasa, offspring of Parasara, 
had finished this greatest of narrations, he began to consider how he might teach it to his disciples. And the possessor of the six attributes, Brahma, the world's preceptor, knowing of the anxiety of the Rishi Dwapayana, came in person to the place where the latter was for gratifying the saint and benefiting the people. And when Vyasa, surrounded by all the tribes of Munis, saw him, he was surprised and, standing with joined palms, he bowed and ordered a seat to be brought. And Vyasa, having gone round him, who is called Hiranyaga, seated on that distinguished seat, stood near it, and being commanded by Brahma Parameshti, he sat down near the seat, full of affection and smiling in joy. Then the greatly glorious Vyasa, addressing Brahma Parameshti, said, O divine Brahma, by me a poem hath been composed, which is greatly respected. The mystery of the Veda, and what other subjects have been explained by me, the various rituals of the Upanishads with the Iyengas, the compilation of the Puranas and history formed by me and named after the three divisions of time, past, present, and future, the determination of the nature of decay, fear, disease, existence, and non-existence, a description of creeds and of the various modes of life, rule for the forecasts, and the import of all the Puranas, an account of asceticism and of the duties of a religious student, the dimensions of the sun and moon, the planets, constellations, and stars, together with the duration of the four ages, the Reich, Sama, and Yajur Vedas, also the Adhyatama, the sciences called Vinaya, orthoephy, and treatment of diseases, charity, and Pasupadadharma, birth. Celestial and human, for particular purposes, also a description of places of pilgrimage and other holy places of rivers, mountains, forests, the ocean of heavenly cities and the Kalpas, the art of war, the different kinds of nations and languages, the nature of the manners of the people, and the all-pervading spirit, all these have been represented. But, after all, no writer of this work is to be found on earth. Brahma said, I esteem thee for thy knowledge of divine mysteries, before the whole body of celebrated munis distinguished for the sanctity of their lives. I know thou hast revealed the divine word, even from its first utterance, in the language of truth. Thou hast called thy present work a poem, wherefore it shall be a poem. There shall be no poets whose works may equal the descriptions of this poem, even as the three other modes called Asrama are ever unequal in merit to the domestic Asrama. Let Ganesa be thought of, O Muni, for the purpose of writing the poem. Sati said, Brahma having thus spoken to Vyasa, retired to his own abode. Then Vyasa began to call to mind Ganesa. And Ganesa, obviator of obstacles, ready to fulfill the desires of his votaries, was no sooner thought of than he repaired to the place where Vyasa was seated. And when he had been saluted, Ayasa addressed him thus, O guide of the Ganas, be thou the writer of the Bharata, which I have formed in my imagination and which I am about to repeat. Ganesa, upon hearing this address, thus answered, I will become the writer of thy work, provided my pen do not for a moment cease writing. And Vyasa said unto that divinity, Wherever there be anything thou dost not comprehend, cease to continue writing. Ganesa, having signified his assent, by repeating the word, Am, proceeded to write, and Vyasa began, and by way of diversion, he knit the knots of composition exceeding close, by doing which he dictated this work according to his engagement. I am, continued Saudi, acquainted with eight thousand and eight hundred verses, and so is Sukha, and perhaps Sanjaya. From the mysteriousness of their meaning, O Muni, no one is able, to this day, to penetrate those closely knit difficult slokas. Even the omniscient Gangsa took a moment to consider, 
while Vyasa, however, continued to compose other verses in great abundance. The wisdom of this work, like unto an instrument of applying collyrium, hath opened the eyes of the inquisitive world, blinded by the darkness of ignorance. As the sun dispelleth the darkness, so doth the Bharata by its discourses on religion, profit, pleasure, and final release dispel the ignorance of men. As the full moon by its mild light expandeth the buds of the water lily, so this Purana, by exposing the light of the Shruti, hath expanded the human intellect. By the lamp of history, which destroyeth the darkness of ignorance, the whole mansion of nature is properly and completely illuminated. This work is a tree, of which the chapter of contents is the seed. The divisions called Paloma and Astika are the root. The part called Sambhava is the trunk. The books called Sabha and Aranya are the roosting perches. The books called Arani is the knitting knots. The books called Varikatand. Buddhyoga the pith. The book named Bhishma, the main branch. The book called Drona, the leaves. The book called Karna, the fair flowers. The book named Salya, the sweet smell. The books entitled Stry and Aishika, the refreshing shade. The book called Santi, the mighty fruit. The book called Aswamedha the immortal sap, the denominated as Ramavasika, the spot where it groweth, and the book called Mozola, is an epitome of the Vedas and held in great respect by the virtuous Brahmanas. The tree of the Bharata, inexhaustible to mankind, as the clouds, shall be as a source of livelihood to all distinguished poets. Saudi continued, I will now speak of the undying, flowery, and fruitful productions of this tree, possessed of pure and pleasant taste, and not to be destroyed even by the immortals. Formerly, the spirited and virtuous Krishna Dwapayana, by the injunctions of Bhishma, the wise son of Ganga and of his own mother, became the father of three boys who were like the three fires by the two wives of Vishitravirya, and having thus raised up Dhritarashtra, Pandu, and Vidura, returned to his recluse abode to prosecute his religious exercise. It was not till after these were born, grown up, and departed on the supreme journey that the great Rishi Vyasa published the Bharata in this region of mankind, when being solicited by Janamjaya and thousands of Brahmanas, he instructed his disciple Vaisampayan, who was seated near him, and he, Sitting together with the Sadduceas, recited the Bharata during the intervals of the ceremonies of the sacrifice, being repeatedly urged to proceed. Vyasa hath fully represented the greatness of the house of Kuru, the virtuous principles of Gandhari, the wisdom of Vidura, and the constancy of Kunti. The noble Rishi hath also described the divinity of Vasudeva, the rectitude of the sons of Pandu, and the evil practices of the sons and partisans of Dhritarashtra. Vyasa executed the compilation of the Parata, exclusive of the episodes originally in 24,000 verses, and so much only is called by the learned as the Bharata. Afterwards, he composed an epitome in 150 verses, consisting of the introduction with the chapter of contents. This he first talked to his son Sukha, and afterwards he gave it to others of his disciples who were possessed of the same qualifications. After that, he executed another compilation, consisting of 600,000 verses. Of those, 300,000 are known in the world of the Devas, 1,500,000 in the world of the Petris, 1,400,000 among the Gandharvas, and 100,000 in the regions of mankind. Narada recited them to the Devas, Devala to the Petris, and Sukha published them to the Gandharvas, Yakshas, and Rakshasas, and in this world they were recited by Vaisampayana, one of the disciples of Vyasa, a man of just principles and the first among all those acquainted with the Vedas. Know that I, Ati, have also repeated 100,000 verses. 
Yudhisthira is a vast tree formed of religion and virtue. Arjuna is its trunk, Bhimasena, its branches. The two sons of Madri are its full-grown fruit and flowers, and its roots are Krishna, Brahma, and the Brahmanas. Pandu, after having subdued many countries by his wisdom and prowess, took up his abode with the Munis in a certain forest as a sportsman, where he brought upon himself a very severe misfortune for having killed a stag coupling with its mate, which served as a warning for the conduct of the princes. Of his house as long as they lived, their mothers, in order that the ordinances of the law might be fulfilled, admitted as substitutes to their embraces the gods Dharma, Vayu, Sakra, and the divinities the twin Aswins. And when their offspring grew up, under the care of their two mothers, in the society of ascetics, in the midst of sacred groves and holy recluse abodes of religious men, they were conducted by rishis into the presence of Dhritarashtra and his sons, following as students in the habit of Brahmacharis, having their hair tied in knots on their heads. These are pupils, said they, are as your sons, your brothers, and your friends. They are Pandavas. Saying this, the Munis disappeared. When the Kaurva saw them introduced as the sons of Pandu, the distinguished class of citizens shouted exceedingly for joy. Some, however, said they were not the sons of Pandu. Others said they were, while a few asked how they could be his offspring, seeing he had been so long dead. Still on all sides, voices were heard crying, They are on Alk, welcome. Through divine providence, we behold the family of Pandu. Let their welcome be proclaimed. As these acclamations ceased, the plaudits of invisible spirits, causing every point of the heavens to resound, were tremendous. There were showers of sweet-scented flowers and the sound of shells and kettle drums. The mystery of the Veda and what other subjects have been explained by me, the various rituals of the Upanishads with the Iyengas, the compilation of the Puranas and history formed by me and named after the three divisions of time, past, present, and future, the determination of the nature of decay, fear, disease, existence, and non-existence, a description of creeds and of the various modes of life, rule for the forecasts, and the import of all the Puranas, an account of asceticism and of the duties of a religious student, the dimensions of the sun and moon, the planets, constellations, and stars, together with the duration of the four ages, the Reich, Sama, and Yajur Vedas, also the Adhyatama, the sciences called Nyaya, orthoephy and treatment of diseases, charity, and Pasupada Dharma, birth. Celestial and human, for particular purposes, also a description of places of pilgrimage and other holy places of rivers, mountains, forests, the ocean of heavenly cities and the Kalpas, the art of war, the different kinds of nations and languages, the nature of the manners of the people, and the all-pervading spirit, all these have been represented. But, after all, no writer of this work is to be found on earth. Brahma said, I esteem thee for thy knowledge of divine mysteries, before the whole body of celebrated munis distinguished for the sanctity of their lives. I know thou hast revealed the divine word, even from its first utterance, in the language of truth. Thou hast called thy present work a poem, wherefore it shall be a poem. There shall be no poets whose works may equal the descriptions of this poem, even as the three other modes called Asrama are ever unequal in merit to the domestic Asrama. Let Ganesa be thought of, O Muni, for the purpose of writing the poem. Sati said, Brahma having thus spoken to Vyasa, retired to his own abode. Then Vyasa began to call to mind Ganesa. And Ganesa, obviator of obstacles, ready to fulfill the desires of his votaries, was no sooner thought of 
Then he repaired to the place where Vyasa was seated. And when he had been saluted, Ayasa addressed him thus, O guide of the Ganas, Be thou the writer of the Bharata, which I have formed in my imagination, and which I am about to repeat. Ganesa, upon hearing this address, thus answered, I will become the writer of thy work, provided my pen do not for a moment cease writing. And Vyasa said unto that divinity, Wherever there be anything thou dost not comprehend, cease to continue writing. Ganesa, having signified his assent, by repeating the word, Am, proceeded to write, and Vyasa began, and by way of diversion, he knit the knots of composition exceeding close, by doing which he dictated this work according to his engagement. I am, continued Saudi, acquainted with eight thousand and eight hundred verses, and so is Sukha, and perhaps Sanjaya. From the mysteriousness of their meaning, O Muni, no one is able, to this day, to penetrate those closely knit, difficult slokas. Even the omniscient Gangsa took a moment to consider, while Vyasa, however, continued to compose other verses in great abundance. The wisdom of this work, like unto an instrument of applying collyrium, hath opened the eyes of the inquisitive world, blinded by the darkness of ignorance. As the sun dispelleth the darkness, so doth the Bharata, by its discourses on religion, profit, pleasure, and final release, dispel the ignorance of men. As the full moon by its mild light expandeth the buds of the water lily, so this Purana, by exposing the light of the Shruti, hath expanded the human intellect. By the lamp of history, which destroyeth the darkness of ignorance, the whole mansion of nature is properly and completely illuminated. This work is a tree, of which the chapter of contents is the seed. The divisions called Paloma and Astika are the root. The part called Sambhava is the trunk. The books called Sabha and Aranya are the roosting perches. The books called Arani is the knitting knots. The books called Varikat and Budyoga the Pith. The book named Bhishma the main branch, the book called Drona, the leaves, the book called Karna, the fair flowers, the book named Salia, the sweet smell, the books entitled Stry and Aishika, the refreshing shade, the book called Santi, the mighty fruit, the book called Aswamedha, the immortal sap, the denominated Asramavasika, the spot where it groweth, and the book called Mozola is an epitome of the Vedas, and held in great respect by the virtuous Brahmanas. The tree of the Bharata, inexhaustible to mankind, as the clouds, shall be as a source of livelihood to all distinguished poets. Such were the wonders that happened on the arrival of the young princes. The joyful noise of all the citizens, in expression of their satisfaction on the occasion, was so great that it reached the very heavens in magnifying plaudits. Having studied the whole of the Vedas and sundry other Shastras, the Pandavas resided there, respected by all and without apprehension from anyone. Principal men were pleased with the purity of Yudhisthira, the courage of Arjuna, the submissive attention of Kunti to her superiors, and the humility of the twins. Nakula and Sahadava, and all the people rejoiced in their heroic virtues. After a while, Arjuna obtained the virgin Krishna at the Swayambara in the midst of a concourse of rajas by performing a very difficult feat of archery. And from this time, he became very much respected in this world among Goman and in fields of battle also, like the sun. He was hard to behold by foe men. And having vanquished all the neighboring princes and every considerable tribe, he accomplished all that was necessary for the Raja, his eldest brother, to perform the great sacrifice called Rajaswiya. Yudhishthira, after having, through the wise counsels of Vasudeva and by the valor of Bhimasena and Arjuna, slain Jarasandha, 
the king of Magadha, and the proud Chedya, acquired the right to perform the grand sacrifice of Rajazuya, abounding in provisions, and offering and fraught with transcendent merits. And Duryodhana came to this sacrifice, and when he beheld the vast wealth of the Pandavas scattered all around, the offerings, the precious stones, gold, and jewels, the wealth in cows, elephants, and horses, the curious textures, garments, and mantles, the precious shawls, and furs, and carpets made. Of the skin of the Rankyu, he was filled with envy, and became exceedingly displeased. And when he beheld the hall of assembly elegantly constructed by Maya, the Asura architect, after the fashion of a celestial court, he was inflamed with rage. And having started in confusion at certain architectural deceptions within this building, he was derided by Bhimasena in the presence of Vasudeva, like one of mean descent. And it was represented to Dhritarashtra that his son, while partaking of various objects of enjoyment and diverse precious things, was becoming meager, wan, and pale. And Dhritarashtra, some time after, out of affection for his son, gave his consent to their playing with the Pandavas at dice. And Vasudeva, coming to know of this, became exceedingly wroth. And being dissatisfied, he did nothing to prevent the disputes, but overlooked the gaming and sundry other horrid, unjustifiable transactions arising therefrom. And in spite of Vidura, Bhishma, Drona, and Kripa, the son of Saredwan, he made the Kshatriyas kill each other in the terrific war that ensued. And Dhritarashtra, hearing the ill news of the success of the Pandavas, and recollecting the resolutions of Duryodhana, Kama, and Sakuni, pondered for a while, and addressed to Sanjaya the following speech, Attend, O Sanjaya, to all I am about to say, and it will not become thee to treat me with contempt. Thou art well versed in the Shastras, intelligent and endowed with wisdom. My inclination was never to war, not that I delight in the destruction of my race. I made no distinction between my own children and the children of Pandu. My own sons were prone to willfulness and despised me because I am old. Blind as I am, because of my miserable plight and through paternal affection, I bore it all. I was foolish, alter the thoughtless Duryodhana ever growing in folly. Having been a spectator of the riches of the mighty sons of Pandu, my son was derided for his awkwardness while ascending the hall. Unable to bear it all, and unable himself to overcome the sons of Pandu in the field, and though a soldier unwilling yet to obtain good fortune by his own exertion, with the help of the king of Gandhara, he concerted an unfair game at dice. Here, O oh Sanjaya, all that happened thereupon, and came to my knowledge. And when thou hast heard all I say, recollecting everything as it fell out, thou shalt then know me for one with a prophetic eye. When I heard that Arjuna, having bent the bow, had pierced the curious mark and brought it down to the ground, and bore away in triumph the maiden Krishna, in the sight of the assembled princes, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Sabhadra of the race of Madhu had, after forcible seizure, been married by Arjuna in the city of Dwaraka, and that the two heroes of the race of Vrishni, Krishna, and Balarama, the brothers of Sabhadra, without resenting it, had entered Indraprastha as friends, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Arjuna, by his celestial arrow preventing the downpour by Indra, the king of the gods, had gratified Agni by making over to him the forest of Kandava. Then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Vasudeva and Arjuna and the bow Gandiva of immeasurable prowess, these three of dreadful energy had come together, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that upon Arjuna having been seized with compunction on his chariot and ready to sink, Krishna showed him all the worlds within his body. Then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. 
when I heard that Bhishma, the desolator of foes, killing ten thousand charioteers every day in the field of battle, had not slain any amongst the Pandavas then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Bhishma, the righteous son of Ganga, had himself indicated the means of his defeat in the field of battle, and that the same were accomplished by the Pandavas with joyfulness, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Arjuna, having placed Sikhandin before himself in his chariot, had wounded Bhishma of infinite courage and invincible in battle, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the aged hero Bhishma, having reduced the numbers of the race of Shomeka to a few, overcome with various wounds, was lying on a bed of arrows, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that upon Bhishma's lying on the ground with thirst for water, Arjuna, being requested, had pierced the ground and allayed his thirst, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When Bayu, together with Indra and Surya, united as allies for the success of the sons of Kunti and the beasts of prey by their inauspicious presence, were putting us in fear, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When the wonderful warrior Drona, displaying various modes of fight in the field, did not slay any of the superior Pandavas, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the Maharatha, Sansaptakas, of our army appointed for the overthrow of Arjuna, were all slain by Arjuna himself, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that our disposition of forces, impenetrable by others, and defended by Bharadwaja himself well armed, had been singly forced and entered by the brave son of Subhadra, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that our Maharathas, unable to overcome Arjuna, with jubilant faces, after having jointly surrounded and slain the boy of Himanyu, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the blind Kauravas were shouting for joy after having slain Abhimanyu, and that thereupon Arjuna in anger made his celebrated speech referring to Santava, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Arjuna had vowed the death of Saint Hava and fulfilled his vow in the presence of his enemies, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that upon the horses of Arjuna being fatigued, Vasudeva releasing them made them drink water, and bringing them back and re-harnessing them continued to guide them as before, then, O Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that, while his horses were fatigued, Arjuna staying in his chariot checked all his assailants, then, O oh, Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Yudhudana of the race of Vrishni, after having thrown into confusion, the army of Drona rendered unbearable in prowess owing to the presence of elephants, retired to where Krishna and Arjuna were, then, O oh, Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Karna, even though he had got Bhima within his power, allowed him to escape after only addressing him in contemptuous terms and dragging him with the end of his bow, then, O oh Sanjanya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Drona, Kritavarma, Kripa, Karna, the son of Drona, and the valiant king of Madra, Solya, suffered Santhava to be slain, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the celestial saktai given by Indra to Karna was by Madhava's machinations caused to be hurled upon Rakshasa Gatotkacha, a frightful countenance, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that in the encounter between Karna and Gatotkacha, that saktai was hurled against Gatotkacha by Karna, the same which was certainly to have slain Arjuna in battle, then, 
O Sanjaya. I had no hope of success. When I heard that Dustadiyamna, transgressing the laws of battle, slew Drona while alone in his chariot and resolved on death, then, O oh, Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Nakula, the son of Madri, having in the presence of the whole army engaged in single combat with the son of Drona, and showing himself equal to him, drove his chariot in circles around. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Jarasandha, the foremost of the royal line of Magadha, and blazing in the midst of the Kshatriyas, had been slain by Bhima with his bare arms alone, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that in their general campaign, the sons of Pandu had conquered the chiefs of the land and performed the grand sacrifice of the Rajasuya, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Draupadi, her voice choked with tears and heart full of agony in the season of impurity and with but one raiment on, had been dragged into court, and though she had protectors, she had been treated as if she had none. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the wicked, wretch Dusasana was striving to strip her of that single garment, had only drawn from her person a large heap of cloth without being able to arrive at its end. Then, O oh Sanjanya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Yudhishthira, beaten by Sabala at the game of dice and deprived of his kingdom as a consequence thereof, had still been attended upon by his brothers of incomparable prowess, then, O oh Sanjanya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the virtuous Pandavas weeping with affliction had followed their elder brother to the wilderness and exerted themselves variously for the mitigation of his discomforts, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Yudhishthira had been followed into the wilderness by Snatakas and noble-minded Brahmanas who live upon alms, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Arjuna, having in combat pleased the god of gods, Triambaka, the three-eyed in the disguise of a hunter, obtained the great weapon Patsupata, then, O oh Sanjanya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the just and renowned Arjuna, after having been to the celestial regions, had there obtained celestial weapons from Indra himself, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that afterwards, Arjuna had vanquished the Kalakayas and the Palomas proud with the boon they had obtained, and which had rendered them invulnerable even to the Celestials, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Arjuna, the chastiser of enemies, having gone to the regions of Indra for the destruction of the Asuras, had returned then successful. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Bhima and the other sons of Pritha, Kunti, accompanied by Vaisarana, had arrived at that country which is inaccessible to man then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that my sons, guided by the counsels of Karna, while on their journey of Goshayatra, had been taken prisoners by the Gandharvas and were set free by Arjuna, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Dharma, the god of justice, having come under the form of a Yaksha, had proposed certain questions to Yudhishthira, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that my sons had failed to discover the Pandavas under their disguise, while residing with Draupadi in the dominions of Virata, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the principal men of my side had all been vanquished by the noble Arjuna with a single chariot while residing in the dominions of Virata, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success.
when I heard that Vasudeva of the race of Madhu, who covered this whole earth by one foot, was heartily interested in the welfare of the Pandavas. Then, oh, Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the king of Matsya had offered his virtuous daughter Otara to Arjuna, and that Arjuna had accepted her for his son, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Yudhishthira, beaten at dice, deprived of wealth, exiled and separated from his connections, had assembled yet an army of seven Highness, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard Narada declare that Krishna and Arjuna were Nara and Narayana, and he, Narada, had seen them together in the regions of Brahma, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Krishna, anxious to bring about peace for the welfare of mankind, had repaired to the Kurus and went away without having been able to effect his purpose, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Kama and Duryodhana resolved upon imprisoning Krishna displayed in himself the whole universe, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. Then I heard, at the time of his departure, Pritha Kunti, standing, full of sorrow, near his chariot received consolation from Krishna. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Vasudeva and Bhishma, the son of Santanu, were the counselors of the Pandavas, and Drona, the son of Bharadwaja, pronounced blessings on them, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When Kama said unto Bhishma, I will not fight when thou art fighting, and, quitting the army, went away, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When upon the death of Drona, his son misused the weapon called Narayana, but failed to achieve the destruction of the Pandavas, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Bhimasena drank the blood of his brother Dusasana in the field of battle without anybody being able to prevent him, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the infinitely brave Karna, invincible in battle, was slain by Arjuna in that war of brothers, mysterious even to the gods. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Yudhishthira, the just, overcame the heroic son of Drona, Dusasana, and the fierce Kritavarman, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the brave king of Madra, whoever, dared Krishna in battle, was slain by Yudhishthira. Then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the wicked Esuvala of magic power, the root of the gaming and the feud, was slain in battle by Sahadeva, the son of Pandu, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Duryodhana, spent with fatigue, having gone to a lake and made a refuge for himself within its waters, was lying there alone, his strength gone and without a chariot, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that the Pandavas, having gone to that lake, accompanied by Vasudeva, and standing on its beach, began to address contemptuously, my son who was incapable of putting up with affronts, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that while displaying in circles a variety of curious modes of attack and defense in an encounter with clubs, he was unfairly slain according to the counsels of Krishna. Then, O oh Sandhyai, I had no hope of success. When I heard the son of Drona and others by slaying the Panchalas and the sons of Draupadi in their sleep perpetrated a horrible and infamous deed, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that Aswataman, while being pursued by Bimasana, had discharged the first of weapons called Aishika, by which the embryo in the womb of Uttara was wounded, then, O oh Sanjaya, 
I had no hope of success. When I heard that the weapon Brahmashira, discharged by Aswataman, was repelled by Arjuna with another weapon over which he had pronounced the word Sasti, and that Aswataman had to give up the jewel-like excrescence on his head, then, O oh Sanjanya, I had no hope of success. When I heard that upon the embryo, in the womb of Virata's daughter being wounded by Aswataman with a mighty weapon, Dwapayana, and Krishna pronounced curses on him, then, O oh Sanjaya, I had no hope of success. Alas, Gandhari, destitute of children, grandchildren, parents, brothers, and kindred, is to be pitied. Difficult is the task that hath been performed by the Pandavas. By them hath a kingdom been recovered without a rival. Alas, alas, I have heard that the war hath left only ten alive, three of our side, and the Pandavas, seven, in that dreadful conflict, eighteen actual highness of Kshatriyas have been slain. All around me is utter darkness, and a fit of swoon assaileth me. Consciousness leaves me, O Sutta, and my mind is distracted. Sati said, Dhritarashtra, bewailing his fate in these words, was overcome with extreme anguish and for a time deprived of sense. But being revived, he addressed Sanjaya in the following words. After what hath come to pass, O Sanjaya, I wish to put an end to my life without delay. I do not find the least advantage in cherishing it any longer. Sati said, The wise son of Gavalgana, Sanjaya, then addressed the distressed Lord of Earth while thus talking and bewailing sighing like a serpent and repeatedly tainting in words of deep import. Thou hast heard, O Raja, of the greatly powerful men of vast exertions, spoken of by Vyasa and the wise Narada, men born of great royal families, resplendent with worthy qualities, versed in the science of celestial arms and in glory emblems of Indra, men who having conquered the world by justice, and performed sacrifices with fit offerings to the Brahmanas, obtained renown in this world, and at last succumbed to the sway of time. Such were Savya, the valiant Maharatha, Srinjaya, great amongst conquerors. Suhotra, Rantideva, and Kakshivanta, great in glory, Balhaika, Damana, Saryati, Ajita, and Nala, Viswamitra, the destroyer of foes, Ambarisha, great in strength, Maruta, Manu, Ikshaku, Gaya, and Bharata, Rama, the son of Dasaratha, Sasabindund, and Bahajaratra, Kritavarya, the greatly fortunate, and Jenamijaya too, and Yayati of good deeds who performed sacrifices, being assisted therein by the celestials themselves, and by whose sacrificial altars and stakes this earth with her habited and Uninhabited regions hath been marked all over. These twenty-four Rajas were formerly spoken of by the celestial Rishi Narada unto Saivya, when much afflicted for the loss of his children. Besides these, other Rajas had gone before, still more powerful than they, mighty charioteers noble in mind, and resplendent with every worthy quality. These were Puru, Kuru, Yadu, Sura, and Viswasrawa, of great glory, Anuha, Yuvanasu, Kakutsta, Vikrami, and Ragu, Bijava, Virihorta, Anga, Beva, Swita, and Fripadguru Lidua, Andrama, Dharma, Damhobla, Pava, Bawa, Apara, Lei, Sega, Gro, Dur, Sambhu, and Holy Diva Vridha, Debahuya, Supratika, and Vrihadratta, Mahataha, Vinitatma, Sukratu, and Nala, the king of the Nishadas, Satyavrata, Santabaya, Sumitra, and the chief Sobala, Janujanka, Anaranya, Arka, Prayabritya, Chuchivrata, Balabandhu, Nirmarda, Ketu Suringa, and Vridbala, Dirstakitu, Brihatkitu, Driptakiu, and Niramaya, Abhikshit, Chapala, Dola Turta, Kripbandu, and Dried Shudi, Mahapurana, Sampavya, Paraha, and Suti. These, O chief, 
and other rajas, we hear enumerated by hundreds and by thousands, and still others by millions, princes of great power and wisdom, quitting very abundant enjoyments, met death as thy sons have done. Their heavenly deeds, valor and generosity, their magnanimity, faith, truth, purity, simplicity and mercy, are published to the world in the records of former times by sacred bards of great learning. Though endued with every noble virtue, these have yielded up their lives. Thy sons were malevolent, inflamed with passion, avaricious, and of very evil disposition. Thou art versed in the sastras, O Bharata, and art intelligent and wise. They never sink under misfortunes whose understandings are guided by the sastras. Thou art acquainted, O prin, plenity and severity of fate. This anxiety, therefore, for the safety of thy children is unbecoming. Moreover, it behooveth thee not to grieve for that which must happen, for who can avert by his wisdom the decrees of fate? No one can leave the way marked out for him by providence. Existence and non-existence, pleasure and pain, all have time for their root. Time createth all things and time destroyeth all creatures. It is time that burneth creatures and it is time that extinguisheth the fire. All states, the good and the evil, in the three worlds are caused by time. Time cutteth short all things, and createth them anew. Time alone is awake, when all things are asleep. Indeed, time is incapable of being overcome. Time passeth over all things without being retarded. Knowing, as thou dost, that all things past and future, and all that exist at the present moment, are the offspring of time, it behooveth thee not to throw away thy reason. Sati said, The son of Gavalgana, having in this manner administered comfort to the royal Dhritarashtra, overwhelmed with grief for his sons, then restored his mind to peace. Taking these facts for his subject, Dwaypayana composed a holy Upanishad that has been published to the world by learned and sacred bards in the Puranas composed by them. The study of the Bharata is an act of piety. He that readeth even one foot with belief hath his sins entirely purged away. Herein devas, devashas, and immaculate brahmashas of good deeds have been spoken of, and likewise yakshas and great yuragas, nagas. Herein also hath been described the eternal Vasudeva, possessing the six attributes. He is the true and just, the pure and holy, the eternal Brahma, the supreme soul, the true constant light, whose divine deeds wise and learned recount, from whom hath proceeded the non-existent and existent non-existent universe with principles of generation and birth, death and rebirth. That also hath been treated of which is called Adhyatma, the superintending spirit of nature that partaketh of the attributes of the five elements, that also hath been described who is Purusha being above such epithets as undisplayed and the like, also that which the foremost Yadis exempt from the common destiny and endued with the power of meditation and to pass behold dwelling in their hearts as a reflected image in the mirror. The man of faith, devoted to piety, and constant in the exercise of virtue on reading this section is freed from sin. The believer that constantly heareth recited this section of the Bharata, called the introduction from the beginning, falleth not into difficulties. The man repeating any part of the introduction in the two twilights is during such act freed from the sins contracted during the day or the night. This section, the body of the Bharata, is truth and nectar. As butter is incurred, Brahmana among bipeds, the Aranyaka among the Vedas, and nectar among medicines, as the sea is eminent among receptacles of water, 
and the cow among quadrupeds, as are the these. Among the things mentioned, so is the parata said to be among histories. He that causeth it, even a single foot thereof, to be recited to Brahmanas during the Sraddha, his offerings of food and drink to the manes of his ancestors become inexhaustible. By the aid of history and the Puranas, the Veda may be expounded, but the Veda is afraid of one of little information lest he should it. The learned man who recites to other, this Veda of Vyasa reapeth advantage. It may without doubt destroy even the sin of killing the embryo and the like. He that readeth this holy chapter of the moon, readeth the whole of the Bharata, I ween. The man who with reverence daily listeneth to this sacred work acquireth long life and renown, and ascendeth to heaven. In former days, having placed the four Vedas on one side and the Bharata on the other, these were weighed in the balance by the celestials assembled for that purpose. And as the latter weighed heavier than the four Vedas with their mysteries, from that period it hath been called in the world Mahabharata, the great Bharata. Being esteemed superior, both in substance and gravity of import, it is denominated Mahabharata on account of such substance and gravity of import. He that knoweth its meaning is saved from all his sins. Tapa is innocent. Study is harmless. The ordinance of the Vedas prescribed for all the tribes are harmless. The acquisition of wealth by exertion is harmless. But when they are abused in their practices, it is then that they become sources of evil.